Hello, we have Andrew, Brian, Hans, Jan, and myself, Michael, at this point. And we would love to talk about some BDI issues, but I will briefly say that at HABSDCon, there was the smallest BeehiveCon ever, which was basically two report slots during the FreeBSD Developer Summit, where I just gave some news from the last oh, year or so. And uh, fortunately, uh, let's see, it was Andrew Turner apparently made some lovely commits that made Beehive on ARM64 become bootable. And Olivier Cochard showed a screenshot that I slipped right into my talk. So it's like, okay, breaking news, everybody. Welcome, Levi. Uh, then the UPB crowd gave a report and We have parallel efforts for Saber Store, but fortunately the libvdsk came up quite a bit and got lots of good positive feedback and encouragement. So hopefully we'll see that sooner rather than later. And I gave a Beehive work in progress session at the end. Hopefully those videos will show up sooner rather than later. So welcome everyone. If you have uh, topics, jump in, but uh, Andrew made a very good point that he could ditch a certain proprietary product by having something like perhaps Apache Guacamole or Spice in front of Beehive such that a user could hop in, a, a VM spins up, and away they go. It looks like, Levi, you've just joined. I know you. we've been discussing things like this. So maybe, Andrew, just, just, just describe briefly the, the workflow you picture. Um, the workflow? Kind of the workflow I picture is where there is at least one idle VM. When a new user comes in, they get assigned that VM and connected to it. And a new one is automatically then spin up to replace it as kind of the idle unused one. And then whenever that user leaves and come anytime they come back, they always get they keep getting the same one. Um this is how we use uh, VMware View in my environment. So this is already something that, at least in my environment, we do. I would just like to have a way to do it and get rid of VMware, because mostly because they pissed me off last week. Okay. And the user always gets the same VM, you said? Yeah. Okay. And we can do stuff, you know, we can do stuff like, Putting the so, VM to sleep to save resources, anything like that, but uh, that's that's would just be a bonus. So, Andrew, are you guys using RDS behind it, or is it just VMware's uh, system there? It is just VMware's solution. Okay. Uh, tell us about this link. Uh, it is so. The th this TV, is somebody's VDI client. This is somebody's project. Um, basically, their intention was to allow you to install that on something like a Raspberry Pi, and that will use Spice to connect to whatever virtual machine the user is authorized to see. This is that's pretty close to kind of what I'm looking for. So, in your case, Andrew. Proxmox doesn't really have a notion to be able to automate the spinning up and spinning down of virtual machines like VMware does. Yeah. But my suggestion would probably be RDS in this case. Well, I mean, I'm... I mean, I started I, I started spending some time looking at this. I didn't come across this link. I'll, I'll take an extended look at that. Um, But I've requested a machine to start thing if I can come up with a way to do it. Mm -hmm. Also consider that NVIDIA does natively support vGPU on KVM. So if that is at all a requirement to help speed things up, that is a possibility. Uh, it's not for our environment. We don't do anything GPU intensive at all. Um, I mean... My guys check their e you know check their email, right. access remote databases, that kind of thing. 
Okay, and Jan had a question. What what like client software would you be hopping in with and desktops? Well, I mean, th this particular link is for a client software. Well, um, like, are you on? Are they on Windows machines or Macs or do they have oh, to be a browser or something else entirely? Uh, a mix. Uh, a mix. Windows machines, Macs, both for sure. Um, I've got one guy who very much likes using his iPad. Oh who is the bane of my existence, even using <laughs> VMware because it doesn't quite work right. And he's com always complains about it. Um, yeah, I, I would also take a look at Apache guacamole. That might also come in handy for what you're doing. That's where the conversation that, started. That's where it started. Invitation. <laughs> yeah. like, come on down. Maybe a mixture of both. So. And Andrew also but, came across Spice. So, Levi, do you have comments on Spice? Uh, yes. So, Spice, from what, from me using it for most of my virtual machines, it's pretty nice because it there's some form of graphics acceleration. Um, it's fairly smooth, and it integrates well with Proxmox. So you can, you know, roll your own tools or use whatever's provided. Just make sure you have the uh, guest agent software installed. That's on the VM itself? Correct. The, okay. It, what does it handle, crazy. do you know? What was that? Do you know what it handles, like uh, graphics or mouse or something, networking? All of it. All so of when it. you install that, Mass ISO uh, basically installs uh, Quimu guest agent, which allows Proxmox to see its IP address and a better understanding of its RAM usage and CPU. And then it also installs the dummy driver for Spice. Okay. So and do you know iOS is that supports? The guest tool uh, support? Uh, primarily Windows. Linux is just a package install okay. for Quimu guest agent. Same with FreeBSD. Oh, there is one for FreeBSD. Yep. Nice. Okay. And the Lumos? Just pushing my luck. Uh, haven't haven't tested on a Lumos, but I would say if it's in FreeBSD natively, it should. Yeah. Hopefully, hmm. be there. Okay. It might. Uh, I mean, it might be a port to get it there, but. Just uh, out of curiosity, is Spice uh, implemented by the hypervisor? via a power virtualized driver or inside the guest or a combination of both? Uh, I believe a combination of both. Basically, it's just it just tunnels your, your display. It, the nice thing is, is that you can pass through USB. You can do multiple displays. It handles it all. So from what I gather, Proxmox basically creates a socket that Spice talks to, and it it's just like being directly connected to that virtual machine's uh, display output. Instead of VNC, it just pipes over Spice. And it's come up over the years, should the, like, perhaps Beehive UEFI firmware support Spice in addition to VNC? I'd say so. It's uh, It's a lot nicer to deal with. And you also gain copy and paste in most cases. Mm -hmm. So I see the guest tools and VD agent, perhaps two different things. Uh, it is packaged under, let me see what real quick. It's oh, the Red right Hat Bird IO. Yes, okay, cool. And we'll drop a link to it. Yeah, I'll just plop this in there. It's a uh... oh, thank you. You're welcome. Think of it like the uh, VMware guest tools or yeah, yep. 
virtual box guest tools. Does anyone else have related experiences or thoughts or concerns or hilarious jokes? <laughs> Not that hilarious, just for the one or two Windows machines I have to run, I just run the Windows native uh, RDP server for single user virtual machines. So just click um, twice and do the RD, VD, uh, screen sharing and off you go. Exactly. And <laughs> it, it's not perfect, but it works well. But it's not what he's looking for. Hmm. But if you need a, a, a few dedicated long-term virtual machines, it's good enough, easy to set up, and completely usable. Which also gets you all of the nice things in the at least in the official client, like uh, copy and paste chat folders and so on, but mm -hmm. because it doesn't rely on any hypervisor support at all. Correct. So the problem is that until it's available, um, you have to manage it some other way, either via the VNC server which um, is slow and uh, picky about clients. And the alternative is uh, to manage, manage Windows over the serial port up to the point where it has a v remote desktop server, which is something a uh, few uh, Windows users know how to do and even fewer non-Windows users. Yeah. Also of note, um, there's a licensing restriction for those that are using Windows in production. Without RDS, you can only have one client connected to a virtual machine at a time, from what I remember. Yes, and the maximum um, uh, um, middle finger to the user is that it does accept the connection and it manages to smoothly animate a logout screen telling you you have to pick between kicking out the user uh, which is locked in or disconnecting. So it does support at least two displays. So all of the multiplexing code is there. It's just locked away behind a very expensive license. Well, of course, all the yeah. multiplexing code is there because, I mean, we would know that anyway because the multi multiplexing code would be there for the minute you paid the license anyway. I mean, yeah. So of course, there are ways around that, but they're not. Mm, yes, in terms um, of the we can thing. talk about that later. <laughs> the easiest, one of the easiest ways around it is to spin up multiple VMs. Yes. Who needs a VM for more than 30 days, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Brian, do you have any experiences on that front? <laughs> I do not. Not something I've dealt with in quite a long time. <laughs> well, other hot topics or cold topics. I was going to say the, the, the one thing that's appealing to me about guacamole is that it seems to have a plugin system that allows you to use different remote access protocols, although Spice isn't one of them, unfortunately. At least not at this time. I'll also throw this out there. Um, XCPNG still holds some of the more proprietary-esque features from Zen server. Uh, just throwing it out there for your own research. By the way, uh, the uh, FreeBSD ports collection does contain a QXL uh, X11 driver using a spy, lip spice. Hmm. So oh, it yeah. looks like exactly uh, a FreeBSD mean. guest may even uh, get proper um, XORG support to output to spice. No, thank I you. Have to do that if you have a FreeBSD yeah. guest. Levi, what's this link? And uh, go ahead and do the uh, <laughs> fresh ports link. That's, that is your bypass. 
Okay. So if you're just that that bypasses the whole one RDP client. Of course, it violates the Windows license. But if you're in a home lab, that uh, just you're aware. <laughs> okay. I will respectfully uh, pretend I didn't see it. Yep. Likewise. <laughs> And then, Jan, what was the name of the X11 client? Uh, it's X uh, Video uh, QXL. It's a port. I don't know if it works um, anymore, but at least it's there. It's ported. Uh, I was hoping to find something else using it, but um, okay. If we have a... Um, Possibly QXL. that one? Yes, that one. Well, oh, thank you. The question is if we have uh, support for uh, um, pointing devices and keyboards and so on. I got to hop so. off, guys. It's, okay, uh, cool. Thank yeah, you for your insights. Yep. Of course. So they still call it XF86? <laughs> Legacy, yeah. In my day. Uh, okay, cool. Um. Oh, Brian, you had some nifty new hardware that was going to be a perhaps lower power virtualization host. Have you made progress with that? I finally got the last part of what I've been waiting yesterday afternoon. So hopefully okay, build cool. it in the next couple of days. Sweet. And was that the super micro either Xeon D or Epic? Yeah, the Xeon D, um, I'm trying to remember what processor it was, uh, 23, let's see here. Yeah, maybe sh should have linked the border platform if they're one and the same. Yeah, um, sure, I can do that, I'll pull it up. By the way, if anyone is interested in a reasonably priced uh, and fast enough uh, ARM64 hardware, um, the uh, Windows ARM64 dev kit should work in 13.2 P1. There's one patch which didn't quite make the deadline. It wasn't ported back. So 14 works, 13.2 should work as well. Oh, on that note, um, there no, is not completely. New... So it Go you ahead. don't get GPU out acceleration and so on and no Wi-Fi, but Ethernet, NVMe, and the CPU cores, and a frame buffer. So and USB. So enough to use it as a build machine. Okay. And it fills the niche above the usual single board computers, but below the uh, budget of a 2U ARM64 box. Uh, I have some news in that department. Let me bring it up. So, uh, with uh, Beehive suddenly booting on the Ampere Ultra. Uh, someone pointed out that there might even be a developer subsidy for this piece of hardware, which is a pretty potent desktop for oh, around $3,000, which is a lot of money, I will say. I'll put that link in there, but um, I'll put that with your notes. Uh, it's it's a rather potent piece of hardware if you need something less than a server for mm -hmm. six to ten grand. Also, note the and I sure would love one of those to fall off a truck here. And Jan, this might be of interest to you. I talked to Christoph Provost in Christoph Provost, not Christoph. That's a very different developer um, in Tokyo, and he did look at 
the beehive performance issues and has some choice words relating to them. And he thinks that the model to follow is the Vienna model. And I think we have uh, Patrick to thank for that. All the research points to him. Let me and check that. It's basically a rather simple device that just slams the VMs networking into the host kernel space. And then the, you probably have to do routing on top of that. But hey, you probably have um, to anyway. So, so he the also may have started a simple, let me just finish this. He may have started a project to do so. Plus, he thinks it would just be a few months of work, but he's not available for a few months. So that was what I heard from KP mm. himself. Go ahead. So the tap device doesn't do anything special for you either. He the question is just if you get a network interface on the host, or is it somehow steals and injects the frames uh, bypassing the normal host network stack? That would be annoying if it's mandatory. So if you can only basically if you could only attach it to a certain physical network card and you couldn't do some kind of virtual machine disconnected from the physical network, then it would be a bit annoying because you couldn't, for example, route it over some overlay. But... Well, Andrew, I assume you're using Viona. Are you, are you feeling limited on it? Um, this would be an implementation detail, not a protocol limitation. Okay, so fine. the guest wouldn't notice the difference. Okay. But one way I could imagine how it could something like that could be implemented is using NetMap uh, to uh, interpose the hypervisor between um, the send and receive ring buffers and the kernel network stack, the, which would get you multi-ring support and uh, batching which is what get, enables it to scale properly. But the problem is that normally it also uh, bypasses all of the performance problems and features offered by the host network stack. Mm. And yeah. Which would still be useful in a lot of cases, but not perfect. I see. Uh, Describe perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, if you go for perfect, you will never finish anything. Well, there's that, but are you still thinking a multi-queue tap device is an no, answer slash the answer? A multi-queue batched uh, tap interface would be a very uh, useful tool, not just for Beehive. Hmm. Um, because all of the user space Ethernet, or if it, we also add it to tap, uh, to tune, not just to tap mode, uh, would profit from this. Because, so, okay, OpenVPN just got their own uh, kernel data path, uh, which is under development, and there was supposed to be a talk on it at HRBSDCon. Uh, yes, I believe Brad Davis gave that talk. And it's nice to see, but. Um, so if other things like, for example, the zero tier mentioned yesterday uh, during the gels uh, call mm -hmm. what could be made to use such a driver or all other kinds of user space um, VPN software. It's a universal interface, which would be not just behave specific and if Linux could stop itself from reinventing the wheel, they could have it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the website's not very detailed on the talk, but I, alas, I missed the talk on the PFSense you know, networking. Uh, when we can expect recordings? Or if um, we... That is a very good question. Hopefully sooner rather than later. And I do know it. it's it's a broader team that handles that. I was hoping to get the uh, BeehiveCon, air quotes, 
talks on a chip that they weren't able to deliver in time, but hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Um, I'll just throw this out there. There were uh, two folks from Azure there, and they are finding that uh, the ConnectX4 performance plummets when using PCI pass-through on uh, 14. Is that an ARM64 specific regression? I believe so. Yes. So I've, I've, I, I, they laid out the problem and um, I did verify that I believe it's on both uh, full pass-through and SRIOV. So did they uh, manage to uh, bisect the regression? And how uh, um, painful is it? I so, is did it... not hear exactly, but yes, uh, there must be a moment in time that things went so. Mm. Doesn't have to be a single commit. It could have been. Okay, I'll inquire. It could be something like an interrupt routing problem or scalability or some interprocessor interrupt shooting down hill bees. It's sometimes stupid stuff. Sure. Um, speaking of which, there was also a talk on OpenStack on FreeBSD and Beehive by maybe one of uh, Lee Wynn's students. So hopefully all those videos will show up and I can link to them and it'll be effortless. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. Oh, and I completely forgot they mentioned a Vertio console bug here. Let's take a look at that. Ba, 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 ba. EFI com console does not work with ARM64 Hyper-V. Open base. The link is in the minutes, and I've opened it up on screen. There you go. Okay, Andrew is looking at it, and that's, I'd say, in the right hands. Okay, so just an FYI, and it's on edit masks radar. So there's that. Um, let's see. Other topics, questions, ideas? The, so, if you for scroll, example, go ahead, Jan. If you scroll down a bit, little bit more, you see that there are also uh, commits. So On this bad boy? And is ARM64 on the radar of anyone present? Well, I'm on this call from an ARM64 system. Uh, is but it's not running involved? FreeBSD. FreeBSD, uh, FreeBSD did work well in the technical uh, preview of the VMware hypervisor for M1 Max, but it would be nice to have a well-supported FreeBSD uh, VM around. Um, Entrenig is using that quite a bit with QEMU and I think one of the front ends. They're using, yeah. the, I guess, the Apple hardware acceleration with PMU and off you go. The thing is that Apple has this thing called Hypervisor Kit. Yep. It's an abstraction designed to allow multiple Hypervisor-like software tools to make use of the virtualization support so that you don't have to choose between VMware and um, VirtualBox on macOS on Intel, for example. Mm -hmm. Whereas normally, for example, you can only have one hypervisor or one type of software using the hypervisor inside the kernel. At once? Uh, at once. So you can't oh. have, for, exa for example, oh, oh, on FreeBSD, oh. you can't have... Uh, Beehive and VirtualBox hardware accelerated at the same time. Oh, but could you have multiple VMs under one of them? Of course. Oh, whew, okay, good. Okay, but the yeah, thing I... is that you can't have. There can be be only one kernel driver for the hardware virtualization support, both on 
Apple uh, ARM CPUs and Intel and AMD. You can't have multiple kernel drivers each handling their own virtual machines without knowing about each other. Fair enough. Like there's only one uh, VM exit like handler and stuff like this. Zen, Beehive, and VDI all conflicting on FreeBSD. It's a somewhat perhaps a reasonable limit, but I could be wrong. Anyway. It's a common hardware limitation. And by always having their um, multiplexer attached to the hardware hypervisor in the kernel, um, Apple forced their all vendors to make use of their API instead of programming directly against the hardware. Correct. Because it's never available under macOS, and so you can have different hypervisors. Correct. Uh, does does anyone have that Microsoft development platform that I should, posted the link uh, to? A friend of mine has one, and... Do you know FreeBSD is working on it, or Lumos for that Yes, matter? he's using it with FreeBSD, but right now he needs um, two patches in 13.2. 13.1 needed a few more, and um, it works in 14, but one of the patches was at least one, I think, maybe two weren't included in the um, MFC because uh, someone forgot. And you did mention that. Thank you, my, my foggy. And the nice thing about about it is that it's a bit beefier and probably cooled and easy to use. So you don't have to mess with uh, multiple single board computers and some kind of breakout car able instead of you have a machine with a P NVMe uh, M.2 slot. Yeah, no, they're generous. I mean, it's like these are the specs you want from Apple, 32 gigs RAM and presumably removable storage. It's like, come on, guys. Yeah, it's basically a, the main board of a Surface device in a different form factor. They have, haven't even removed the uh, display connector. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the GPU um, is a bit uh, strange for, coming from a non-ARM64 point of view. The Adreno. It sounds a bit like Drano. Oh. So uh, don't expect support for, yeah, and the thing is that you, for some reason, Qualcomm loves to put tons of things behind ACPI and uh, EFI calls. So, and in some ways they did things too well. For example, FreeBSD didn't boot initially because they made use of, uh, proper use of the um, bar regions and so on. The problem is that they used memory types which haven't been encountered in the wild so far, which are what you should be using for those memory regions, but no one else bothered to do it correctly. Mm. <laughs> Stuff like this. For example, the hardware uh, really, if you... Me me um, if the boot code is marked in the PE executable as uh, read-write data, then it's read-write data, not read-write execute data. So uh, the bootloader wasn't uh, bootable because it wasn't executable. Hmm. Which is a bug in the FreeBSD um, boot code. But because nobody likes dealing with PE executables, um, <laughs> The way the boot uh, loader is linked isn't uh, the way you're supposed to do it. Alrighty. But now it works. And you finally have something with reasonably fast storage and enough memory to run Pudir. Yeah, that's... Natively. For a build host, that's quite attractive. And it's silent and doesn't break. Uh, Do you know how long the build world takes? Mm, no, I don't. I am curious. The, and the how many ARM cores are the that? Hmm? How many threads does that support? I can't tell from their site. I think for fast and for medium cores or something. OK. So, um, I can ask. Cool. No, that's exciting. 
Because if, hey, if Beehive can support that, then it's a, a lot more accessible a platform than the, than the Ampere yeah, exactly, machine I just because, mentioned. Um, and I think Clara has one, or at least Ellen Jude. The next uh, la larger platform is basically an Altera board or something. Yeah, um, no. that's exactly it for now about 3000 which is air quotes cheap, but still very expensive. <laughs> and doesn't really fit neatly on your desk without Correct. hearing protection. Yeah. Yep, yep. While you can put this thing somewhere and get it working for less than a thousand with, because you still need a SSD, a large enough SSD. Sure. But it's also 600 bucks. And uh, at least in Europe, you had like two days delivery or something. Really? Okay. Yeah, because it's in the normal surface and so on, uh, sales channel. So it's part of the normal consumer sales channel and not handled special uh, custom wait two month uh, shipping from overseas. Cool. Well, anything else at this time? And we've been doing demos on the jail calls, which uh, the, the recordings of which should be up relatively soon. I was not present for the last, the second to last one. But uh, yesterday we had a demo on uh, 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 Dave's zero tier work. I guess Jan, you saw that. So yeah. I don't know if anyone would want demos on the Beehive calls, but that's kind of fun. And it gets questions answered, which is nice. So yes, Andrew wants a VDI demo, of course. <laughs> Get to work um, on that, somebody. Go ahead, Jan. Slightly off topic for this call, but I did uh, learn a bit more about libucl mm. and its features and limitations. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do can't be done cleanly without a tiny change to libucl. If I get that feature in, uh, it would be very easy to and straightforward to do what I want to do. Uh, otherwise, um, and that was yeah. templating of the systems. The, the, the thing is that if you're using libucl and there's macro support, and you can register your own macros, mm -hmm. and macros uh, take an argument, but also options. So, and the options are uh, passed as libucl configuration. So it's, you get a, basically a sub configuration pre-passed for you. So that if you write your own macro, you don't have to uh, pass something out of a string. If you want options, you get the string you're supposed to template basically and a set of options already pre-passed as a, a configuration object with potentially sub-objects and so on. The downside of this approach is that um, it's implemented by temporarily um, instantiating a new parser and feeding the, um, the string to the parser and using the resulting object. What's problematic about that is that the uh, newly created parser doesn't have access to any of your variables and so on. And that's a problem for me because I need uh, basically the um, or need well. It would be a not, lot nicer if I could have the jail name available in the options for macro expansion. I think there's a rock around, but it would be really ugly. Mm. Basically, the idea would be to take the object, uh, emit it again into a string and then loaded this string surrounded by, by some context into the uh, top level configuration and delete it afterward. So basically clobber some name in the current position of the tree. It's not, it would be, Ugly, really, but it would be possible at least. 
I hope I don't have to do it. I uh, reported the issue and asked for a parser option mm. to uh, inherit all of the registered variables, macros, and callbacks, and so on. I don't know if I will get a response. I haven't dealt with a project, but it's still an active maintenance, at least. Cool. So uh, there's a good chance we can get, have the nice things. <laughs> Well, Godspeed with that. Any final thoughts, ideas, questions? Just that uh, once we have a nice uh, UCL front end for jails, we could um, we use it for Beehive. Indeed. And for those who didn't hear, Antoinette uh, banged out a proof of concept Lua based UCL reading front end for jail which may lay the groundwork for a front end for Beehive as an alternative. And on that note, thank you, everyone. I can hang out for a moment, but I say we call it at about 9.49 Pacific and talk to you in a week. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.